Hi everyone, I'm Dr. J, Achan and Master Teacher in Soma Veda Thai Yoga Therapy, and I'm here to dive deep into sustainable eating and Thai Yoga. As much as we love Thai Yoga, Ayurveda, Yoga Therapy, and Natural Medicine, uh, hands-on, pyrethesia, and practical application of our techniques, our facilitated asanas and postures and so on and so forth, none of that is going to work if our clients are not eating right. And eating right, it takes a lot of information and takes uh, a lot of dedication. It's really simple once you understand the basics. And I'm going to give you a lecture here in this documentary, in this DVD, about sustainable eating practices which will make your Thai Yoga, Ayurveda, and Yoga Therapy practice more successful for yourself and for your clients. As always, your likes, comments, and subscriptions are appreciated, and I'll see you next time. First of all, uh, welcome, welcome. I'm so happy uh, that you guys have come to this sustainable uh, conference and just the, the exploration of, of what is sustainability. And I, I want to say, uh, when Tom originally asked me uh, to speak, that I, that I was a little bit intimidated. And, and I want to say it's actually, it's actually continued as the weekend has progressed, I've been listening to the different speakers. I'm like going, oh man, these guys sound like experts. Like they act, they really know what they're talking about. And there's a lot of a lot of passion about what sustainability is and and what a sustainable uh, uh, life uh, means. And then going around and talking to some of the vendors, uh, just beautiful people with really succinct and clear and dynamic visions about what what they're trying to achieve, which is, uh, in one sense, um, uh, again, it, it's, a, it's a little bit intimidating. I, I'm a doctor, okay? Uh, I'm, I actually am a licensed medical doctor. I'm a, I'm a naturopathic physician. I'm an oriental medical doctor. I'm also uh, a Vidya. I have, I'm a board certified Indian medical doctor. So I'm kind of like doctors up one side and doctors down the other side. But the one thing I'd have to say is, uh, whenever you hear about alternative medicine or complementary medicine, or if you hear about wacky medicine uh, that actually has conscience, uh, you know, whatever you think of when you think of that, who are those people? Uh, I'm one of those people, and I'm proud to be that one of those people, you know. Uh, and so I teach medicine. I teach uh, alternative medicine. I teach holistic health. I teach yoga. I teach uh, uh, everything about uh, uh, what it means to try and, and survive in this world as a healthy, balanced person. And when I came to the subject matter of sustainable living and, and you know, we were just talking about, I said, well, what could you talk about? I said, well, you know, we could do just like 10 principles of health for sustainable living. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, that's just crap. I'm not going to be able to do that. And first of all, um, anybody who knows me knows that one thing I like to do is kind of get behind the curtain a little bit and go behind the scenes and get to the real issues because I'm one of those crazy doctors that thinks that we have to uh, to balance and achieve optimal wellness and health that we actually have to go to the origin of the causes of our dysfunction. And the problem with that is, you know, there's a lot of them. And some of them are kind of big, you know, because, you know, there's such a thing as, as geopathic stress. You know, there's such a thing as uh, economic stress, there's such a thing as social stress, there's such a thing as ecological stress, there's such a thing as interpersonal stress, uh, there's such a thing as toxins and poisons and bacteria and virus and radiation and chemicals and especially radiation right now, but also uh, chemicals and, and there's also such a thing as we are our worst own enemy, <laughs> and etc. All these things contributing to whether or not right now this minute you feel happy, 
or right now this minute you feel well and how are we going to get to that much less and then how are we going to sustain that oh my god it's a complicated issue but uh, we got to start somewhere. And actually, I've taken some insight from some of the other presentations here, so it, I, I may not be able to remember uh, the individual names of the presenters. I was so tied up in, in the really beautiful messages that they have that, that sometimes I kind of lose track of the individual. But I want to keep, I want to always pay respect that um, uh, I learn from other people. That's, that's basically how I got here. I've been fortunate to have really good role models for sustainable ideas about health and wellness and balance as a person and that's what I'm trying to perpetuate. So anyway, I'm Dr. Anthony James and this is my home and this is where I live and this is my classroom and this is where I teach every day and I just want to welcome you uh, to share our space and to bring your energy and to bring your contribution on a personal level because I actually think one of the core concepts that we have to focus on is sustainability is that we, we do get caught up in the environment. You know, we get in caught up in the ecology. Uh, we get caught up in the, in the external landscape issues. But the bottom line is we're people, we're kind of concerned with ourselves. We're kind of concerned with each other. And one of our primary motivations to try and find sustainable solutions to the questions that the world is giving us right now is, is so that we can survive as humans, so we can survive as people. I think it's, it's really important that one of the ideas that we have for sustainability is that we keep reaching toward connectivity with each other and that we don't let these issues separate us and cause us to fracture and to go off in our own little survival corners with our own little survival strategies. I think our survival as a species, as a person, as an individual, and our survival as a species is absolutely connected to us as people, as human beings, remaining connected to each other. And whatever else, whatever kinds of strategies we're working with, we gotta, we gotta hang. Uh, because uh, our survival is dependent on each other, all right? And so, no matter what else I want to say, it's always going to be in the context of community. Because actually, the more I, I've researched this, the more I've realized that I don't have a snowball's chance of hell in surviving long term if you're personally, if you personally aren't going to help me do it. Not a snowball's chance in hell. It's not going to happen. Because I am, on some level, many levels actually, simultaneously, I am completely dependent on my community for survival. And so no matter what is our individual strategy of, of sustainability, we have to keep bringing it back to our family, to our friends, to our community, which are all, by the way, flesh and blood people. You know, you prick at them, they doth bleed, <laughs> kind of thing. You know, that's the core of it right there. All right, so first thing I want to do is I know we have uh, also in our mix in our community, we've got some people who are, you know, hardcore sustainable educators and permaculture educators and so on. Uh, but we've also got, and I've talked to a few people here who don't really, they don't even know what the word means. You know, they're not really sure what, what's the sustainability thing. What, what, what does that even mean? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with that. And then I'm just going to take my marching orders and try and get through as much of, of what I have to talk to you about as possible, okay? I know you're probably not going to remember anything other than the uh, hello. Uh, uh, however, I also believe there is such a thing as the Akashic Record. I also believe that the Stress Adaptive Human Biological Transformational Machine, which is sitting in the chair, has an absolute perfect ability to mimic, to record, and to adapt to external environments and circumstances, and that if, in fact, I can say anything at all that has substance, that resonates with any core of truth within you, you will have a perfect memory for it, and at some point you will, it, you will recollect it in context, Although, you may not remember where it came from, and I'm okay with that. Okay, so having said that, what are the principles of sustainable living? Well, whatever it takes to live a long, 
healthy, and happy life while respecting and caring for the community of life in which we live. I mean, that's a pretty simple definition, yeah? Working to improve the quality of our life, enabling human beings to realize their full potential for life expression. Building self-confidence and leading lives of dignity, which are in and of themselves fulfilling. Okay, that's, that's part of my definition. Continuing. Living in such a way as not to be a burden, creating suffering for ourselves or for others while seeking health, education, a decent living, political freedom of expression human rights, freedom from violence. Sustainable means stepping away consciously from the origin cycle of the creation of suffering for ourselves and for others. But some, some of you might uh, recognize that last phrase. It's the last uh, statement in the Metta Sutra Buddhist mantra, uh, which is essentially uh, the, considered to be the most perfect example of bodhicitta or generating perfect thinking that the most perfect example of a thought that a person can have in their head is may all beings be happy, may they be free from suffering. Regardless of high or low or middle status, may they be free from suffering. And the last sentence in the Metta Sutra says, uh, may I no longer participate in the origination cycle for the creation of suffering for myself and for other beings. And so essentially, those are the principles of sustainable living. And then we have the technologies and idealisms and philosophies of sustainable living, which are how do we get there? How do I no longer participate in the creation cycle for suffering for myself and for other beings? And then how do I explore and experience and exchange and receive the effect of that uh, philosophy? And then we get into our technologies, our green technologies, okay? We get into our democratic social imperatives. We get into our holistic medical paradigms. We get into um, our uh, geologic viewpoint, you know, uh, uh, think global, act local. <laughs> you know, we get into all these things. These are technologies to actually uh, implement the imperative that, you know what, uh, I just want to say no to pain and suffering and disorganization and disease and manipulation and coercive ideolo idea ideologies. How do I do that? And how do I do that in real terms, both for myself, my family, my friends, my neighborhood, my community, my city, my town, my county, my state, my country, my nation, my ocean, my sky, my world. How do I do that? And is there a way that I can be functional on all those hierarchies? And actually, I believe that it's possible. I do. Because again, you know, I'm, I'm another one of these um, holotropic minded people and holographically minded people that I believe on some level simultaneously within the context of my humanity and expression of physiology and my DNA, that energetically, physically, emotionally, and mentally, I am connected to the global paradigm of life. I am part of that, that thin veil or film on the surface of Mother Earth we call organic life. And on some level, we all serve a function. We're all interconnected in that way. There is a way to live within the framework of internal and external natural equilibrium, so sustainability is the key. To conserve the Earth's vital resources and diversity while promoting our own. For ourselves, our friends and families, our children, children's <coughs> children. As the Native Americans say, we work for the life of seven generations. <coughs> sustainability. The main reason to be sustainable is that it's crazy not to be. It's crazy. To not be sustainable is just to be is is actually by definition. If you actually understand what's going on, uh, it would be insane to not be, or to have that idea. So I, I don't want to be crazy. You know, I want to. Uh, you know, it's been part of my path of life to move uh, uh, myself through whatever means was available to a progression of of sanity. I want to be more. I don't want to be less. It's crazy not to be sustainable. 
It's, it's um, counterintuitive to your survival. That's crazy. Thinking and doing and being, thought, action, and deeds, which are counterproductive to your survival and the survival of those around you is freaking crazy. And so I don't want to be crazy. But that's one reason I want to be sustainable. Uh, did anyone hear the lecture yesterday on paleo human life here in the state of Florida? How many people heard that lecture? Okay. Hear the part about periodic human die-off? <laughs> Hear the part, you know, it went back 12,000 years and he said there's proliferation, there's like millions of humans at this point, you know, anthropologically speaking, we've got millions of people in this our geographic region, and then they just kind of go away. <laughs> there's a period of time where there's not. Okay, and then there's several thousand years later where they're like, you start to see uh, a continuation, but it's not too good, you know, like the technologies aren't too good, you know, it's like they lost something. They lost something. And then they kind of pick it up and they get going again and, and the arrowheads get a little sharper <laughs> and a little more, you know, uh, precise and all this kind of thing. Uh, and then they go away. And for a couple of thousand years and then they come back and, and you know what? Uh, my understanding is we're at the precipice of one of those cycles right now. And we have arrogance to think that it's this cycle, which is uh, obviously has been repeated several times just in the last 12 or 15,000 years, that somehow, because we're so special, that we're not going to be subject to the consequences of ignoring our environment both the external environment and internal environment. Because you listen to those anthropologists and they say things like, well, over uh, harvesting of their food, <laughs> uh, inappropriately harvesting of their food. Oh, that led to massive die-offs. Uh, you know, spreading of disease without containment strategy. Oh, that led to massive die-offs. Uh, not understanding the impending doom by changing planetary conditions. Oh, well, that led to planetary die-off. Uh, there's all, all of, guess what? We got all, folks, we have all of these things happening right now. And I guess, if anything, the only difference between us and our paleo brothers and sisters is that we have the internet. <laughs> and we actually have uh, more of a real-time uh, communication network uh, and that we can begin to communicate and address these issues uh, a little bit faster in real time, whereas our paleo brothers and sisters uh, were dependent on the telephone game to communicate this information. No, the sky is falling, the glaciers are coming, the glaciers are coming. And then, you know, a couple of thousand miles away, uh, it's something about there's a guy with snow cones <laughs> coming. There's a guy with snow cones. Well, I don't even like snow cones, so I'm not really concerned with that. Okay? And so, and so they, you know, so they were subject to that, that problem, okay? Uh, we have the possibility of hope because we have the possibility of communication. So that's what we got going for us. It's not necessarily technology. Right now, the thing we have going for us is the possibility of hope is that we can actually have the possibility of having a simultaneous global communication. Right now, this second, there are groups, just like the group in this room, who are having exactly the same conversation about exactly these same topics in about a hundred different locations around the planet. Right now, this minute. Right, that's never happened before. So that's our possibility of hope. But what are we going to do with it? That's, that's the question. We need also... Uh, it's one thing to philosophically to get it. It's another thing to have practical solutions. All right, so I'm going to go through some uh, practical solutions. All right. Because we're ahead of the curve, right? I think we actually, you know, I'm a hopeful guy. I actually do believe that there is uh, hope that we can um, come out of this and that we can actually survive in a good way. And so that's what I work for. Um, I want to focus on what I think is really the, the fundamental issue in sustainable health, okay, uh, which, which again, pardon me, I mean, if this is really elementary for you guys, because I know there's some experts in this in here, 
but I'm just speaking across the board and kind of giving you my list. Uh, but uh, I believe the number one issue is food. Number one. I believe the number one issue is food. Uh, the reason I believe the number one issue is food, and you know, here I am, I have all these doctor technologies, and no matter what I learn, I keep coming back to the number one issue is food. Uh, is because it's the one issue above all others that we actually have the capacity to substantially control. And so because we have the ability to actually have some input in what we eat and where it comes from and what is the impact of our food on ourselves and on our environment, then that's, that's one of the places where we can add our influence, both internally and externally. So that's why I choose to focus on food. From, but I'll, I'm going to keep coming at it from a health point of view because, you know, I just can't help it. Uh, Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine, let medicine be your food. All right? But then we want to say, what is medicine? Because there's a lot of misconceptions about what medicine is. Well, actually, the definition of medicine is actually the same as the definition of what is sustainable living, by the way. You know? And so that, there's a source of conflict and confusion right there. We, we compartmentalize. We create distinctions. We say, oh, medicine's over here. Oh, food is over here. And there's some crossover. But, but I want to say that that is a misconception. That's a misperception. And um, because go back to what's the definition of, of sustainable living. Whatever it takes to live a long, healthy, and happy life while respecting and caring for the community of life in which we live. Well, guess what? That's the definition of medicine, too. Whatever it takes to live a long and happy life. Okay? And so we have our technologies for that. So let food be your medicine. So let food be part of your strategy of whatever it takes. Let whatever it takes. <laughs> let, let food, you know, in other words, let whatever it takes to be happy be your food. Okay? So no, let's, let's don't eat things that don't make us happy. <laughs> That'd be a real simple way to say it, wouldn't it? Uh, I want to, just as a sidebar note, as far as uh, sustainable health, um, based on statistics, uh, other than changing your he eating habits, the number one thing you can do to prolong your life and guarantee that you'll have a long, healthy life in this country, and not necessarily talking about the whole world, uh, is to do whatever it takes to stay out of hospitals and stay out of the conventional medical system. Whatever Amen. it takes. Okay. According to JAMA, you know, I'm a medical doctor, so I can actually get a copy of JAMA. Okay. Uh, and of course, you know, there's now quite a few different journals that are published under the, the banner of JAMA. Uh, but according to JAMA, and I think this is conservative estimate, okay, because it might be a little self incriminating. Uh, as many as 380,000 people a year die directly from medical malpractice. Okay, so according to the premier journal of the American Medical Association, approximately 380,000 people a year die as a direct result of medical malpractice. All right, um, how many, you know, we drive down the highway and we see billboards with, uh, you know, with like the sheriff and the, the reflective glasses, you know, and don't, you know, uh, drive drunk and pay the price. And we see billboards with mothers against drunk driving and, and with, with like the cameo of their teenage son or daughter who will not live a long and happy life because of an incursion due to drunk driving. Uh, every city in the country, including the one we're in right now, Plant City, Zephyr Hills, has federal, state, and local funding for uh, millions of dollars for the formation of DUI task forces, uh, random roadblocks, breathalyzers. Uh, there's uh, been uh, 12,000 uh, constructed expansions of uh, prisons in the United States just to take the additional prisoner loads of, of the uh, incursion of DUIs and drug people and so on into the jail system, into the, the legal system. And there's about 48,000 deaths a year as uh, average as a result of drunk driving. Now, I'm not for drunk driving. That's not what I'm saying. Compare that to 380,000 
deaths a year due to medical malpractice. And when's the last time you were driving down the road and you saw a billboard with a man or woman in a white jacket with a stethoscope hanging around their neck with a, have you seen this person? Call 1-800-STOP-DOC and report that you have seen one of these people uh, wanted for uh, murder and mayhem, wanted for malpractice, wanted for just damn not trying to help you and being part of a system that kills you at four, five, and six times the annual rate of drunk drivers. And I'm just saying, okay, that's what they say. Now, that's not the bad news. It gets worse. <coughs> According to these uh, medical statistics, I'm not quoting the National Enquirer, okay? Although, technically, uh, it might be more accurate if I was, and I'm sorry to say that, right? Uh, another 400,000 simply from unsuccessful procedures that were properly applied. In other words, it wasn't malpractice. In other words, they did exactly what was the standard uh, medical practice according to standard medical disciplines, according to standard medical procedures. And that is 400,000 people where the operation was a success completely. We did everything right and the patient died. Okay, another 400,000. Now this number is per year. This is not forever. This is not over the last 100 years. This is the annual numbers, all right? So 400,000, this is uh, side effects, which by the way, there's no such thing. How many people have heard that there's such a thing as drug side effects, anybody? <laughs> I know, it's kind of a silly question, isn't it? Okay, I wanna say that, uh, that you've been misled that that's a programming issue, that's a propaganda issue. There actually are no side effects of any known prescription drug or procedure. There are secondary effects which, are, which we don't want, which are less popular, okay? Because you can uh, get a copy of the Merck Manual or the physician's desk reference to drugs and uh, et cetera, and for every single drug, there will be the primary benefit uh, you know, listed, and then immediately there will be up to 92 different secondary effects. Uh, for marketing, they're referred to as side effects, as if they're optional, okay? But uh, my little brother, for example, is the Eastern Division uh, Vice President of CVS Pharmacy, and he's an a, a advanced uh, degree in pharmacology, okay? And uh, he would say that it's chemistry and that you, you know, ingest the chemical, you get the effect, and the chemical doesn't know primary from secondary. The chemical actually doesn't know what a side effect is. It just does what it does. And so um, for many of these drugs, there are up to 92. Uh, so I've actually seen a drug here and there that had more than that, but, but let's say between 70 and 90, uh, secondary effects, and about a third of them are fatal. About a third are fatal. That's how you get these 400,000, see. Got to be logical. You got to say, well, how, how do we get there? And that's not the malpractice. That's, you were supposed to get it and everybody agreed that it was appropriate for you, and it still caused you harm. So what is the alternative? If we're not going to I uh, uh, rely on the conventional medical system as our primary health care, let food be your medicine, let medicine be your food, then the source of your primary health care has to be your eating habits. Okay, it has to be. has to be. You have no choice. There is no other alternative. You want to talk about alternatives. You, you have no choice. And I know some of you, there might be one or two people in here probably offended to even hear me say so. All right, I'm just giving you my professional medical advice. And like you would with any doctor, <laughs> take it or leave it, you know? You know, it's my opinion as a medical practitioner. Um, health is a fluid balance between toxicity and deficiency. That's another way to say it, all right? The Chinese say it's an equilibrium between internal and external pernicious influences. Internal and external pernicious influences could be basically anything that reduces our capacity to live the full natural possibility of life or what our life as a human being 
on this planet could be. That's, that's everything from the environment and everything from the landscape. And we talk about two different kinds of landscapes. We talk about the inner landscape and we talk about the outer landscape. Internal and external pernicious influences. So internal pernicious influences are what takes place when uh, harmful influences bridge the uh, world skin barrier and become uh, part of us and, and are uh, causing changes within us. And this would also include uh, mental states, emotional states, our psychology. But it also includes completely the ecology of our inner world, how we handle toxins. Uh, how we handle virus, how we handle bacteria, how we handle cancers, how we handle all that. That's all the internal landscape, external landscape, is everything outside of your skin that has the ability to affect your longevity and your health and well-being. And that's everything. And so we talked about the five elements, right? Because we have, you know, fire, earth, metal, water, wood, or, or in Chinese medicine, in Ayurveda, we have ether, air, fire, water, and earth. Any way you slice it, it's all about whatever is out there is part of us. And then we get this really funny philosophy which says that we are also part of everything that's out there. All right, so health somehow is about managing this equilibrium between the inside and the outside, the two landscapes. We uh, sometimes use the word soil, and I know permaculture people uh, I really want to uh, talk about the soil a lot. In fact, that's why I love them. <laughs> uh, first book I ever read on it was Secrets of the Soil, right? And, uh, you know, I got this whole different idea about the ground, that it was alive, you know, and that there was energy in it, and that there was, you know, and that it was communicating to me. And that, of course, you know, I knew from my Bible lessons as a child that eventually I become the soil. And I was like, whoa. From dirt to dirt. So what you're saying is that I'm actually a child of the soil, and then I am soil in a flesh bag walking around for a while, and then I go back to my origin, which is the soil, and somewhere I, I lost the, the connection, the conscious knowledge, that I was really just a bag of dirt walking around. And so what is my function then as mobile dirt? You know, what, what is my function? And I realized, I was thinking about this, I had this little realization that part of the reason why we're so unhealthy is because we have been separated from our proper relationship to our mother ecology, which of course is the soil. And so because we are now uh, eco-encapsulated soil flesh bags, uh, we think that we're separate, and so we, we pretend and we act and we uh, uh, create structures which are based on this false idea that we are somehow separate from the soil, and we no longer rely on the soil as our nutrient base, and we no longer also honor the fact that it's part of our life cycle to sustain the soil. So in fact, what is the, you know, we talk about, oh, I'm looking for my path, and what is the purpose of a human being? Well, there's probably lots of purposes for a human being, but part of the purpose of it, first of all, what is a human being? Well, a human being is a mobile expression of the vital life of the planet, okay? And that part of the reason why we were given legs in the first place was to act as landscapers <laughs> and uh, to act as caretakers and to act as moderators and enhancers of the vital communication capacity of the earth which is expressed in the life of the soil. And, when, and then at our proper time to rejoin the community of, of other sentient beings in the earth which all return their essence to the dirt. Oh my God, that's just crazy. But you know what, if you start to think about it like that for a minute, I think some things might come clear, okay? Because, just like the Native Americans say, you know, what is a human being? Well, uh, uh, well they just say, simply put, an upright, an upright two-legged being. No different than any other. No different than the four-leggeds. No different than the ones with wings. No different than the ones who swim. No different than the ones who crawl through the earth. 
no different than the microbes. You know, guess what? Microbes are sentient. How about that? Bacteria is sentient. Virus is sentient. All living beings, like the like the Dalai Lama says, all living all living beings are sentient. We pray for all sentient beings. So guess what? When we're praying for all sentient beings, you're praying for a virus. You're praying for the bacteria. Guess what? We are utterly and completely dependent on the viruses and the bacteria in the soil for our life. Utterly and completely dependent. And somehow we lost that connection. And so when we begin to experience them in our body and we, we think that they're foreign invaders and so we have to cut, kill, and burn them. And we have to destroy them. And what do we do? We do the same thing that happens when we apply pesticide to the soil outside. We kill it. And it no longer is able to sustain the biodiversity that life is dependent upon. Monoculture prevails. And where monoculture prevails, diversity dies. Where diversity dies, inevitably there is a dissolution of life and a cascading domino effect on other ecologies and eventually everybody draws the same picture if we continue to create monoculture the world is gonna not be suitable for human existence at a definite point in time everybody comes to the same conclusion if we do the same inside of our body guess what we come to the same conclusion we don't need to kill the bacteria in our body we don't need to kill the viruses in our, bo our body. They've always been with us. We need to learn how to be an ecosystem within ourselves. We need to learn how to communicate. Communicate, nonviolent communication. How about that? MVC applied to your body's internal ecology. I'm not trying to kill the bacteria in my body. I am negotiating an existence that is compatible, that is mutual, that is supportive. And that's what my food strategies are about. They're not about trying to, you know, people say, well, what about infection? What about, well, uh, well, yeah, what about it? What do you do when the soil pH is not right? What do you do if you look at the soil and the mycology and bacterial structure of the soil is not right? Do you then kill it? Do you, what do you do? You amend it. You amend it. You amend it. What do you do? You actually bring in plants. You bring in structures that out of their life cycle will create the balance that you want. Why? Because that's sustainable. Anything else you do, dump some chemicals on it. Uh, it will chemically give you a balance, you know, on a test. And then you will have the imbalance, which will be the consequence of it, and it won't be sustainable. And in fact, the longer you do that to the soil, force it to produce, the longer you force it to produce, eventually that's called desertification. You eventually kill it. You actually reduce its ability to sustain life at the microbial level to a point to where it's no longer possible for that to happen. And that soil is now sand. It's just, it's just rock. It's no longer able to sustain life. We do the same thing to ourselves when we don't eat right, when we don't have productive eating strategies. See, I want to bring the same strategies to eating that we would think about as far as the soil, right? Inner soil, outer soil. That's what I'm saying. Man, I'm almost, you know, whoa, well, uh, this is terrible. <laughs> All right. So what is? And by the way, the interface. You want to know how to get connected to the earth. The easiest way in the world to reestablish and to revitalize your connection to the earth is to bring consciousness to what you eat. That's it. It's so simple. You don't have to get all big and spiritual, oh, Mother Earth. Blah blah blah. You know. I get to say that because I'm also a native, adopted Native American. I'm a proud member of the Crow tribe. Okay, I'm a pipe carrier and I'm a member of the medicine uh, tribe and the Whistling Water clan and the Apsalaga Whistling Water people, the Milagushe tribe. Okay, and so I say it tongue in cheek, but I want to say my father Floyd Rilberg uh, would have said it the same way. He would have said, I don't give a damn about ritual and external ceremony. The only thing Mother Earth cares about is how you live. 
period. Mother doesn't care. You do a smudge, you light some sage, you whoop a pipe around in the air. Mother Earth doesn't care. Mother Earth is all about how gentle do you walk on her? How compatible are you to her other children? And these kinds of things. It's more important who you are than what you do. You want to get in touch with the planet? You want to get in touch with your roots? You want to get in touch with your most fundamental spiritual essence? You want to get in touch with the source of life? Bring consciousness to your food. I'm just giving it. It's an easy way. See, I'm the laziest person you've ever met in your whole life. So I'm always looking for what's the easiest way? What's the easiest way I can make all these universal connections? Because I'm a lazy guy, right? So I figured it out. Well, the easiest way to handle all those things is to bring consciousness to what I eat. And guess what? Just by doing that, not only do I get to live healthier and happier and be more functioning, as does my family, just by doing that alone, for example, I personally, I lost 50 pounds in the last two years. And I haven't been on a diet for one minute. I eat like a freaking horse because I love to eat. Okay, I just brought consciousness to my food. And my body, soil, harmonized. It equalized. It balanced. Okay, and it looks like me, 50 pounds lighter. Okay. All right, so let's go. Let's run through a couple of things. Okay, one, I want to throw this out. Consider eating lower on the food chain. You ever hear this? You know this justification. You know, like the food thing. You know, the little things eat the bigger things, and the bigger things eat the bigger things, and, and then it goes on until there we are. We're at the top of the food chain. We're eating every damn thing else. Okay. Well, when you start thinking of sentient being and the company of other sentient beings, well, that's not going to work, is it? It's not sustainable if we eat everything else. Okay, it's not going to work. We need to get a little bit lower down. You know where we should be naturally on the food chain? Right about where the herbivores are. Okay? Right about where the herbivores are. This whole, like, uh, second and third tiers above that, guess what? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Tried it. Doesn't work. Looks like we're going to destroy the planet. Okay, tried it. Give it a shot. Doesn't work. We're the, we, we got that whole food chain thing wrong. We need to get down on the food chain, right? In other words, as a permaculture person might say it, we need to get our hands dirty. You want to know what's going on with the soil? What do you got to do? I, I told somebody yesterday, you know what the, the finest, most sophisticated technological instrument ever created for agriculture is? The finger. And so I, I personally, I think that's why we have them. You know, some people say, oh, it's for tools. Well, if a tool is a hoe, then yes. But that's not the only reason we have fingers. We have fingers so we can point at each other and say, hey, you ain't doing the right thing. We have fingers so we can put them in the dirt and know what's happening. That's how we make our connection, right? You want a superpower? You want to develop superpowers? Spend more time with your fingers in the dirt. We call them in yoga, we call them siddhas. You want to develop siddhas? You want to become a rishi yogi, a magnificent supernatural superman or woman of a human being? I'll give you a secret. Get your fingers dirty. Get your hands dirty. It will change your life. It will change your life. Okay, I'm, 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 I hate this. Actually, I love this, but it, it really is a condensation for me. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's my own issue. So even though I don't have all the time in the world <laughs> to address my, my, my need to communicate everything in, in the greatest possible detail, I love it. I, I love and forgive myself for putting myself in this position. You have 15, you have 15 more minutes. It's not helpful. Because <laughs> that's my issue. Even though I only have 15 minutes left, it covers 17 primary issues. <laughs> uh, so we're going to try and do this one, one a minute. Okay? All right. So uh, the first line I want to just conceptually give you about bringing sustainable ideas to your health and specifically relating to food is I want you to consider changing your definition of edible. And you've heard that word before, edible. Okay? I want to challenge what that means. And I want to say, 
uh, that one of my ideas that I would recommend to you is to bring consciousness to your definition of the word edible. It may be enlightening for you. It may be very, very helpful. All right, here's, uh, and, and in that context, I also have a corollary, and I want you to be crystal clear. Substantially the same as food does not equal food. <laughs> Okay, whenever you see something, <laughs> I know it's kind of funny. Isn't it? Whenever you see something that's labeled or marked or which is promoted to you as substantially equivalent to food, okay, I want you to be crystal freaking clear that that means it's not food. <laughs> that's what that means. It's not food. Okay, because food is food. And anything that's not food, you know, it's something else. Okay? Most likely it's chemical. It's, it's actually a derivative of oil. Okay? Of crude oil. So 99% of substantially the equivalent of food, whatever that is, is a derivative of oil. And as a human species, as a biological species, we were never meant to consume oil or oil byproducts. And you have to understand this, for most of our ecological life, if we were, whether we, uh, as was said yesterday, whether we evolved as species over billions of years from plankton to uh, human beings, or whether, you know, you take, a, you know, this, this creationist biblical perspective and it's only six or seven thousand years, okay? Still, however you do it, the entire time we've been here, it's only in the last hundred years that, that we've been exposed to byproducts of, of carbon and oil because they were underground. And there were a few sources of natural tars and natural oils, but 99% of humanity didn't have access to them. Okay? And so biologically, we have not in our DNA the compensation to be able to metabolize crude oil in any form or in any derivative or in any solvent that, that is a derivative of it. And that is why that's one of the primary ecologic contributors to food, which has contaminated our food supply, is adding oil into our food. One of the biggest things we can do is um, be clear about that. Substantially the same as food does not equal food. All right, here we go. All right, number one, edible should mean, edible should mean, well, organic. Fresh, whole, non-GMO food. If it's not organic, we should automatically question as to whether or not it's adulterated and to what degree. We have to keep an idea in the back of our mind while selecting food, and that is, there are no known safe levels for any chemical in the human body. So it is a, not a true statement, it is not a scientific statement to say that the, the amount of contamination with XYZ chemical has been deemed to be safe for humans. Scientifically speaking, don't take my word for it, you can research this, scientifically speaking, there are no known safe levels of any chemical substance. None, zero. There are no known safe levels of any chemical. Anybody who says otherwise, uh, well, I'm sorry, they actually haven't looked at the science because that's what the science says. All right, number two, edible should mean reduce adulterated food consumption. Adulterated foods also mean foods which on the surface are advertised as natural or real but have been adulterated via the manufacturing process and include things such as trans fats, hydrogenated fats and oils of any kind, high fructose corn syrup, uh, refined sugar, aspartame, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which are advertised and promoted as natural or derivative of natural substances, which scientifically and chemically are not. Absolutely not, okay? Oil is natural, so technically all, all additives, chemicals, and constituents which are derived from oil, uh, for marketing purposes, you could say are derived from natural substance. All of them, which are coming from the parent, are, are equally harmful. And there's none that are not. There's none that are not, including baby oil. <laughs> Just because it says baby doesn't mean that it's healthy for you. 
Baby oil contains benzene, for example. Benzene is known to be one of the most deadly, dangerous immune disruptors uh, that man has made. It's not the most dangerous, you know, plutonium is the most dangerous, but, you know, it's right up there. It completely, immediately, and instantaneously disrupts your immune system. Let's don't go into that. That's in baby oil and chapstick. Edible should mean local. Weigh and measure what you eat based on how far it does, uh, how far it comes to get in your mouth. The further the origin of your food, the higher the carbon footprint. Again, there's that oil in the air. The, um, the carbon footprint, contribution to toxic environment, contribution to contamination of water, support of fossil fuel industry, oppression of native peoples, deforestation, etc. All of this eventually comes back to increase your own toxic exposure. Uh, yeah, you know. That's the way it works. I have my favorite foods, which come from other countries, okay? And it is really, uh, has been a challenge to me, for example, uh, to reduce the amount of uh, foods which come from foreign countries. And that includes herbs, that, can, that includes spices, that includes the kind of rice that I prefer, that includes etc. etc. It's been a real challenge, but I'm working on it. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, I'm transitional. It's very hard when you have a fully, a beautiful kitchen like I have that's fully stocked with spices and we got eight different kinds of rice and all this kind of stuff. And it represents an investment. And see, mentally, I have a problem tossing out everything in my closet that has a foreign origin because I, I can't help but think of the economics of it. But then I start to think about the economics of it and I start to be able to let go a little better, okay? I've got to make it personal, got to make it emotional. Uh, conscience, by the way. We need conscience. Edible means to, uh, to eat food with a clear conscience. To have a clear conscience about what you eat. Well, what does conscience mean? Okay, I'll give you my definition of conscience. Conscience is an emotional realization of the truth, okay? So it's very important for me that when I eat, that I have a good conscience about what I eat, that I emotionally know that, that I'm doing the best that I can. And if I emotionally don't know that, and I go ahead and I consume it anyway, okay, then I am also acquiescing to the possibility of harm that that food's going to cause me and it's going to cause somebody else. Oh man, that's, that's tough. I know it's tough. Edible means, first of all, to eat less meat. Research from many sources suggests minimum 95.5. I'm just saying, it's just science. I mean, it's nothing personal. If you want to live happier, healthier, longer lives, if you want to support the soil inside and out, you want to support the ecology, you want to reduce global warming, uh, you want to have uh, uh, more support for democracy in the world, eat less meat. And then, whatever meat you do eat, Make sure that it's that you're supporting the local farmers. That it's organic. That it's grass-fed. That it's free-range. That it's chemical-free. That it's antibiotic-free, etc., etc., etc. And don't expect it to change overnight. That's why I use the 95.5. It's unrealistic to expect everyone to become a vegetarian now. We've got several thousand years of indoctrination into eating meat equals prosperity to overcome. And that's it. We, we're not going to be able to turn on a dime. And you vegetarians and you vegans, get the freak off the back of your meat-eating friends. <laughs> get off their back. What you resist persists. The harder you push them, the harder they hold on to those unproductive uh, ways of eating. Okay? You want people to change the way they eat, set, do it by example, make, make the most nutritious, happy, fun-filled, exciting food that you can to share with them so that they feel like it would be crazy not to eat that, and it makes it easier. All right? Edible means to prefer a plant-based diet. Okay? Aside from the morality question of cruelty to animals based on factory production of animal-based foods, animals remain uh, let's see, animal food factories are the single, single largest users of antibiotics. 70% uh, of all manufactured antibiotics go to animal food production. 70%.
So if you're against the use of antibiotics, and if you are again, if you think that the the uh, epidemic increase in antibiotic resistant uh, uh, methicillin and staph bacteria is not a good thing, i.e., flesh eating bacteria, which according to CDC is epidemic, okay, then. 70% of the epidemics are actually, uh, of the antibiotics are not being used in human patients, they're going to the cows that people eat. And, and then from their urine and their feces into the water supply, and then from the water supply of, this, of the aquifers into the water supplies of the hospitals, where it is then recycled into the bodies of people with deficient immune systems, where they then become susceptible to antibiotic resistant bacteria. See, it's the circle of life. <laughs> Eat less meat. Prefer a plant-based diet. Uh, edibles should mean eat the widest variety of foods that you can manage. Eat the widest variety of food that you can manage. Good permaculture based garden uh, in the same little square foot of land, you should be able to grow uh, six, eight, ten different kinds of plants. No reason why not. Uh, go to Thailand. Uh, you'll see farms that if you're not paying attention, you would never know was a farm because it looks like a jungle. It looks like an overgrown jungle. And then you say, well, what do you mean farm? And they go, no, no, this is a farm. It's a multi-generational farm. We've been farming here for years. And you're like, we're on a trail in the jungle. And they're like, no, no, you're on a trail through the farm. They're like, I'm looking around. I'm like, what farm? What are you talking about? And the guy goes like this reaches out, grabs a leaf off a bush, and plucks it up, and he says, put this in your mouth. And I take a bite of it, it's green tea. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> oh, and he said, I said, there's tea plants here. He goes, no, there's 10,000. These are all, tea. this is a tea plantation. I thought I was in a jungle. <laughs> okay, I said, well, what is all this other crap around the base here? He says, oh, that's edible morning glories. These are coffee. So you know coffee and tea can grow together? They can. You don't have to monoculture even coffee or tea. They grow together. Oh, well, what is this kind of viney thing here? It looks like it's choking the life out of these plants. And say, oh, no, that's edible morning glory. Pop, boom. Edible morning glory. Oh, it turns out one of my most favorite green foods on the whole planet is morning glory. Okay, I'm like, whoa, never would. It looked like a jungle, okay? Uh, eat the widest variety of foods you can manage. Why? That's why foods naturally grow in the world in a healthy ecosystem. So that is the way that they are supposed to come into our system, is in great variety and in rotation, which is uh, seasonal, okay? Edible should mean to eat seasonally for your region of the country. Okay? Uh, again, a billion years of, of inculcation of data for survival in our DNA tells us that the most appropriate foods for us to eat at any given time are the foods that are ripe and ready for harvest right this minute. That's what we're supposed to be eating right now. Okay? If you don't know what that is, well, that shows the measure of separation from the environment that you're currently suffering from. In other words, environmental affective disorder, EAD. Okay, so that's a symptom of your EAD. Uh, and so what you want to do is you want to treat your EF, EAD naturally. And the treatment for EAD is education. You want to uh, stick your nose, open up the window, look outside, talk to a friend and say, hey, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's March, end of March. Uh, what is in season? What, is, what foods are in season? And in my, my geographic area, and those you should seek out as your primary foods. And see, it will change. It will change. It's supposed to rotate, just like in nature. The soil's not always the same. Even, even uh, the, the variety that you see in the natural ecology uh, in December is not the same that you see in March. But there will still be an equally great diversity. It'll just be different. Same, same, but different, as the Thais say. Munkan, my munkan. Same, same, but different. Okay? Edible should mean eat only foods you know you are not allergic to. All right? I want to say everybody in this room knows or suspects that there's something that they eat that they're allergic to. 
When you eat foods that are allergens, they cause a histamine reaction in your brain. That triggers an inflammatory response in your tissue. That triggers edema. Inflammatory response and edema are the hotbeds of disease. Okay? So one of the ways to prevent disease through your eating habits is no matter what you eat, stop eating the foods that you already know that you're allergic to. Okay? And, and by the way, that's any food that when you eat it regularly makes you feel bad. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's really easy, you know, but we're so out of touch with our, our inner ecology that we don't know. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm running. All right, edible should mean also to buy local. Okay, aside from the carbon footprint, guess what? We buy food from Peggy and Jeff. Why do we buy food from Peggy and Jeff and Eco Farm and so on? Because they're our neighbors. <laughs> That's it. That's the reason. Because they're our neighbors and we want to support them and they're up to good things and they're, help, they're, ha they're helping us to have a, ha a longer, healthier, happier life. And by God, if I'm going to support anybody in the world before I send a hundred bucks to the American Red Cross, I'm going to send a hundred bucks to Peggy and Jeff and buy some food with it. Okay? Uh, I need them. They need me. And so that's why I do it. Buy local. Make it personal. Okay? If you don't know personally someone local that you can buy food with, okay, that's a social affective disorder. Okay? And so you need to cure that by getting out and meeting somebody who grows food. Uh, consider your overall attitude towards eating and food in general. If it has a label, read it. I'm just saying, if it's, if it's got a label on it, don't buy it until you actually read the label. You'd be surprised how many times you'll put something back that you were 99% sure you're going to buy. After you read the label, you're just like, whoa, <laughs> and off it goes. Um, don't waste food. Okay, and that goes actually to my last one, which was to compost. Uh, make the best possible food choices according to your understanding. Before shopping, make a list. In other words, if it's not on your list, it's probably not edible. Grow something to eat. Anything. <coughs> Grow something to eat. Everybody here should be in their home life growing one food item. Grow anything. Grow a chive. I mean, come on. I mean, grow something. Grow anything. Anybody can grow a chia pet. <laughs> you can eat them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> grow something. All right. It's about your consciousness. See, it brings consciousness. It brings energy, attention, consciousness, breath, and pressure is the imperative to change your environment. Grow something. Grow anything. Involve your family and friends, church, or social networking group in a food project, or join one. Edible should be part of that. Edible should be, you, everyone should compost. Make your food beyond interesting and nutritious. Listen, we've got to be ninja. Okay? Ninja. I'm a ninja for food. You know how I ninja, how, how I ninja raging carnivores into a plant-based diet? You know how I do it? Julie and I, we get, we craft in the secret dark recesses of our <laughs> attic with our candles and our sigils on the floor and our sacred tomes of secret knowledge, I mean recipe books, favorite recipe book, and, and we, we flip the pages and we recite the magic incantations of holistic, organic, local, fresh, seasonal ingredients and we put them boil, boil, toil, and trouble into our cauldron our magic cauldron and we put our own energy we put our own sacred essence into that boiling cauldron of magic elixir and we we call it to allurement we call it to glamour and we call it to create life and we call it to manifest our vision for the world as we see the swirl of the world inside that pot and then we serve that on the table and it's an irresistible force. And people are drawn to it. Oh. <laughs> what is that? And Julie goes, dinner. <laughs> and then they eat that. And they're like, ooh. Uh, oh, uh. You can see it. You can see it. You can see it. Trying to adjust. 
trying to adapt, trying to, to, to encapsulate the idea that the most tasty thing that's ever crossed this inner and outer brain, this barrier, has no meat. And it's tasty. And it's medicine. And then they start to make these little adjustments. They want to know what's the... What, do you have a recipe? <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are the ingredients? Uh, is it hard to make? No, no, you just throw some shit in the ball and stir it up. It's easy. It's easy. And then they start to do it. And next thing you know, next thing you know, you've got, a, you've saved a soul. <laughs> you've got another person who is going to live a longer, healthier, happier life. Okay, well, thank you very much. i got to quit. Thank you.